Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for Torah study. So excited to be able to study your word and just to walk with you, Lord, today, Lord, like every day, Lord. Every day should be a, just a newness with you, a newness to be able to walk with you and fellowship with you and to change our lives one day at a time, Lord, and allow our lives to affect others, Lord, whenever we get an opportunity to do that, Lord. And I just give you praise for everything that you do. Um, I'd like to say a prayer. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Ashir Kedeshano B'Mitzvotah V'Tzivanyu La'asot B'Devrai Torah Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with thy commandments and commanded us to engross or immerse ourselves in the words of the Torah. Amen. Amen. Well, today's topic is what happens when Jewish, African, and Greek cultures collide. And we say, I just love that topic because we deal with this honestly every day. We just might not think of it in this scale. Um, every time, actually me and Daphne were just talking about this, kind of on our way here, we were talking about how when, some, when two people get married, that's two cultures that collide. And sometimes you have an explosion. Here's our synergy. Sometimes you have this when two cultures collide, when two people get married. Maybe you have an energy that goes on. Y'all, anybody remember seeing these little, what happens when it, I, I wanted something this visual that would work, but this is about as visual as I get. Um, you know when one ball goes on one side, the energy kind of goes through, and it goes to the other, it pushes it over. Y'all get that? I know Brad knows this. This is all science right here, okay? He's loving it back here. He is just loving it. He's a science guy. He can't help it. He just loves it. But that's what happens sometimes when cultures collide. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. And I think, matter of fact, I know that God's original intent is for cultures to collide and it to be this energy, kind of like these balls. It's like one, you connect, you learn from this part of the culture, you learn from that part of the culture. It's not something that's just set in stone. Because what, but again, sometimes what happens is, I have another picture. This is also what kind of happens. Two cultures collide. Kind of looks like we're getting ready to have an explosion, right? Let me get to my real explosion. Bam. This is what happens in many cases, right? You have two cultures that collide. We're going to talk about the African culture. We're going to talk about Greek culture. We're going to talk about Jewish culture. And we're going to talk about, again, on a small scale, I like thinking of marriage because in a marriage, when two people come together, sometimes you have this right and sometimes you have to work through it until you get to this that's the goal it's the same thing when you're dealing on a broad scale with large cultures it's the same thing it's God's original intent his original intent is for he started off with this people he started off with Adam and Eve but Adam and Eve that transferred to a people called the Jews and these people called the Jews, they've been, they've, give, they've been given a grand task. And think about this task. The task was to share God with the world. Imagine that. That is, that is just, to think about that is a daunting thing to think about. This people is supposed to share God with the world. But when we learn this, if we're from another culture, we need to be grateful for that. We need to be grateful that God allowed this group of people. That's why we need to learn from this group of people called the Jews, if that makes sense. So, uh, I have a lot of foundational things I wanted to go through before we get to this. Uh, we might not even get to a lot of the culture stuff today. We may get to a lot of it next week because I, I always like to do a lot of foundation. Because you know if you try to build a house and you don't have a good foundation, what happens? Crumbles, right? It's going to come to the ground. It's one of those things that are very obvious. Some things, honestly, are so obvious that we don't take advantage of it because we're so used to it. We almost can be, we can come complacent to it because it's always, we think it's always been there. And I think every time anybody talks or we speak, um, anybody talks, um, our job is to inspire, to inform, and to impart. This is our job. When we deal with anybody, not just me, I am just happen to be standing here talking, but our job, any person that we come in contact with, 
our job is to inform them of something, inspire them in, about something, and to maybe impart something that God is implanting. Because imparting and, and inspiring is a little different. Imparting is something that means it's, it's something you're going to grab hold of and you're going to take it. Like I remember the first time I learned about tithing. It's been years ago, but I argue, it's a simple concept to me now, but I argued about this for years because I thought I could just give whatever I wanted to give, right? Why not? I can, I'm a free will agent, and I had all kind of arguments, ridiculous arguments behind it, but I was completely wrong. And how many of you in many things and some things have been wrong and loud and wrong? Come on, you can admit it. It's all right. Nobody's watching. Anyway, all right. Everybody's watching, okay? The world is watching. The world's not watching. But we should admit when we're loud and wrong because I think we need to be able to go back and learn from that and see when we can go back and learn from it, we can help somebody else. See, that's why it's so important. It's simple. Our job is to inform. So who am I going to inform? I'm going to inform somebody, don't do that dumb thing that I just did, right? I need to inspire them. How do I inspire them? That takes a lot. It just depends. Maybe I'm going to inspire them the way I am just living my life because they're watching me. Um, an example, I didn't do this. On, I was just minding my own business. Um, Daphne probably knows what I'm going to say. Daphne knows what I'm going to say most of the time. Yeah, she does. <laughs> she knows my thoughts. Uh, but I was in the grocery store minding my business. I had like 10 minutes to get to another meeting. I had to go. It was a teacher meeting I was going to. And I needed some food. I was hungry. And I have committed myself to not going to fast food restaurants as much as I can. Anyway, to make a long story short, I went into, um, what was it? It was Publix. And I went to go get some salad, some other stuff to eat. I only had like 10 minutes. Anyway, I went to my car. I have a bowl in my car. And I have a, you know, the thing, what do you call it? The colander that you rinse your food with. Um, so I went to put the salad in there. I went to rinse my food, and I was just in the back of my van. I had some bottled water, so I was rinsing it over there on the side, and I was fixing my salad back there. And this lady, she was going to the grocery store, and she was walking. She just stopped. She was just like, what are you doing? Literally, like, I knew who she was. I didn't know who she was. She was just like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm fixing my salad. I only got to, you know, I just told her what I was doing. She was like, wow, that is so awesome. You know what? You didn't even know it, but you just inspired me today. And she just went in the grocery store. She inspired me that I inspired her. And I think that's how we should live our lives. We should, and that's just one simple incident. But I think if we are not necessarily excited about it, but when we're passionate about something, our passion, it just bleeds to everybody around us. You can't even help it. It's just the way it is. And it should be that way. We should be passionate about serving the Lord. And if we're not, we need to pray about it. Say, Lord, help me. Because I'm not passionate today. I want to go back to bed. Anybody ever had that feeling? Yes, I'm raising both hands. But you know what? That's what we need to, we need to focus in and say, Lord, I need help. And that's how God's going to help us. That's why, again, to go back to that simple thing, we need to learn how to inform people, maybe with words, maybe with actions. We need to learn how to inspire them. And we need to know how to impart. However that happens, God's going to show us in so many different individual ways. That's just life. It should be life. One thing I wanted to focus on was the most important thing, I think, on this planet that we need to, because again, I love talking about culture. We're going to get there. But I believe that the gospel is the most important thing that we need to focus on in this world. Because guess what? Every one of us, one day, is going to meet our maker. All of us. I love talking about the end times. I do. But... Um, um, 100% of us, five out of five, will die one day. Are we right? Yes, all of us will. So we need to know what's going to happen to us when we die, all of us. And not just us, because sometimes I think we think so narrow, we just think about us four and no more, me, myself, and I. But it's so much bigger than us. When we get an opportunity to impart to some one person, that one person is probably, not probably, they're connected to a family. Maybe, they're, maybe I'm able to minister to a teenager who's 15 and he just got blessed and he's going to change his life. One day he's going to be a dad. One day that dad's going to be, he's going to have some children. Maybe those children, they're going to have grandchildren. You get the point? So when you affect one person, we are affecting generations. And we need to see it that big. 
Um, and sometimes, and this is something else here, some things we make an emergency. I think sharing the gospel in our lives should be an emergency. It should not just be, oh, it's just something I got to do. No, it's an emergency. There's some things that are not important. There's some things that are somewhat important. There's some things that are very important. There's some things that are emergency. Think about that. Think about things that are not very important. Maybe, there's no teenager in here, maybe playing video games. I bet nobody in here plays video games. Anybody play video? Nobody in, under my voice. No. What's something else that's not important? Watching TV. Is that an emergency? No, that's not an emergency. That's not very important. Um, what about if your job called you and they made a mistake on your check and they need your social security number? What does that just become? Emergency. You stop everything you're doing. You stop breathing. Whoa! I'm just I'm texting right now. You want me to come up there? I'm over, I'm over there tomorrow. I believe that's what the gospel has to be in our lives. It needs to be an emergency. And it's not just we're telling everybody about the gospel because honestly that doesn't, I'm just being honest, that doesn't work. When I first got, when I was first found the Lord, I was a little zealous. I was a, okay, I was very zealous. There were times that I even went door to door. I had a door to door ministry. It was my own and I loved it. I even made a little flyer. I called it, anyway, I just made up something and I had five questions. At the end, it said, if you were to die right now, do you know where you go? And honestly, I had a lot of conversation about that. A lot of people we talked to about the Lord, and it was great. It's awesome. But I just know that's a ministry, and certain ministries are for a season in our lives. Some things don't last forever. I think some things we start here, and then now we move to something else. But whatever your ministry is to minister to people, it needs to be an emergency. Because God loves us that much. In the scripture it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In Hebrew, that's the emet, the derek, and the chayim. I love learning Hebrew. No one comes to the Father except by me. How do we portray that? How do we, that should come out of our pores, however that happens. Um, eternity is like, I love this analogy. I heard somebody say it. Visualize, um, if we look at this room, y'all see the line, the continuous line at the top, the corner? Visualize that line going on forever, right? That's eternity. Visualize a little, see that little, the little hook right there? That little hook or a dot on that line, that's our lives. That's just how magnificent eternity is. And in that little dot is where we make the decision to spend the rest of eternity. It's that big of a deal. It's like we have an opportunity and I love talking about this, with, especially in, in high school. I say, you have an opportunity to share with your, with your peers only in this part of time. Because they might not listen to you when you get old. I'm just being honest. You know, if somebody's 15, they'll probably listen to another 15-year-old more than they're going to listen to a 46-year-old. Because they think, I'm, I'm old, or who cares? I don't know what they think. They just think weird stuff. But the point is, sometimes we have a sliver of time to share the gospel. And that's why we need to be prayed up. We need to be ready when God opens up the door for us to share the gospel. That is the most important thing. The most important thing. Let me give you another analogy. Visualize the gospel as many people in our world are drowning. And we have the gospel lifeboat. Do y'all see that? Yeah, people are drowning all around us. And we have the gospel lifeboat. How, how am I going to get you a lifeboat? How do I do that? I'm not going to let you down. Many people are starving. And I have the bread of life. Many people are poisoned. And I have the Messiah antidote. Many people are in the dark. And I have the light of the gospel. Many people are in bondage. And I can speak the word of truth that will bring them to liberty. It's that important. It needs to be there. And every generation has the seemingly daunting task of spreading the gospel. Sometimes we think things are automatic, and it's just not. It's not just for a rabbi or rabbis or our teachers to stand and say words about the gospel, and we come in and sit down and chill. That's not what it's all about. It's about us taking our lives and preparing our lives to share. And if not, honestly, I think we're doing something wrong. 
because we're not just coming in here just to hang out. This is not a social club. If it is, I like to hang out. All right. We should hang out and share the gospel. Because maybe you're hanging out sharing the gospel. Maybe you're going to minister to somebody by your hanging out. Like, wow, that guy looks really cool over there. I want to come hang out. Sometimes I like to use things as bait. In school, we use donuts as bait. That's bad, huh? Is that bad? Anyway, I don't care. Okay, I'm just going to be straight. Because you know what? If somebody will come in and eat a donut, and they eventually say, you know what? I kind of like this God thing. I buy donuts every day. It's that important. Because what happens when one person, what do the angels do when one person receives the gospel? It says the angels rejoice when one person, it could be a billion people out there. And one person, that one little guy or little girl, whoever she is, and she goes, you know, wow, I mean, that was awesome. I'm going to go home and change. Maybe that person that you inspired, you didn't even know it, maybe that's the next Billy Graham. I think it's that important because sometimes we think it's about us. And it's about somebody who isn't even, might be not even be here. It might be somebody that's in Japan. I looked at our stats for last month. Um, I wanted to share it with the video team. We had, it was over a thousand views from Japan. Isn't that beautiful? So somebody right now is listening to me speak words about our Lord and Savior. And maybe they're going to get connected to the Messiah just from these words. Because I truly believe that even though I'm speaking, whoever's speaking, God is speaking to you in individual ways. It's not my words. Sometimes I think we can get kind of whatever in our brain, like, yes, what I'm doing, this, this is not the show. The show is what God is doing in each one of our lives. God is speaking to each one of us in, each, in so many individual ways. That's why, to me, it takes the pressure off of me. Because sometimes I think I can get up here and go, blah, 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 blah. Amen. No, I don't do that. But the point is, God is speaking to us in so many different ways. And we need to understand that and be grateful for it. All right, some more foundation. I want to talk about Tov and Ra. What is Tov and what is Ra? Tov, y'all know what Tov is, right? What's Tov? Tov is like good. It means something's good. What is Ra? Ra is... Yeah, I remember watching, uh, what's the Prince of Egypt? I think they had something on there about Ra. Anyway, Ra is like evil. It's bad. It's very simple. That's all it means in Hebrew. Um, God placed man in this garden and said, Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this is foundation. There were two trees in the garden. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I, everybody here knows that. But if you were God, wouldn't you want people to know the difference between good, which is tov, and evil, which is ra? Think about that. I want everyone on this planet to know the difference between good and evil. I have an analogy here. So would you want to live next to someone that could not distinguish between good and evil? Maybe they were great citizens, but they could kill you just as well as go to the grocery store. It's not a problem because in their mind, maybe they don't know the difference between good and evil. They think maybe it's good to kill you. How do we know the difference? Great question. Question number one, why the trees? Question number two, why the you cannot eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, my goal is to answer those. And I got some of this, a lot of this from, um, y'all heard Rabbi David Foreman on H.com? Got a lot of this from him. It's my source. I have a lot of sources. The serpent obviously was trying to deceive. Right? We know that. Let's see how he was doing. In Genesis 3, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 2, it says, this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, now notice, he said, did God, but that Hebrew word for God is Elohim. It's just Elohim. It's important. I'll get back to that. It says, did God, Elohim, actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the tree, the fruit of the trees in the garden. Hmm. So he said, you are to eat, you can't eat from these trees. But the woman replied, 
we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. Eve actually does a great job here. She responds the way she should have responded. So Eve says, basically, that's ridiculous. God said that I can eat from all of the trees. So at this point, if you look at it, um, Satan basically failed at this point. Eve responded with what she should have responded with. Satan actually left something that was very subtle. That a lot of us, I didn't see it until I um, heard him talk about this. Um, At first glance, it looks like the serpent failed. But if you go back and look at Genesis 3, verse 1, it says, He called God Elohim. Well, Elohim just means God as, it it kind of relates God as king or judge. He's only king and judge. That's it. Um, After each day of creation, and, and you remember in Genesis 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of wars, and God said, let there be light. And then he says, day one was, and then he said it was good. He said it was tov. Day two, he said it was good. Y'all remember that? All right, cool. It says, um, God was assessing or judging everything that he created as good. Now visualize this. And in Genesis 1, every time the name God is used, it's always used as Elohim, which means he is God the king, he is God our judge. That's it in Genesis 1. And that's because he was creating things. He was creating the worlds. So he was the king, he would judge, he was the authority over everything. In Genesis 2, he's referred to as yod heh vav And yod heh vav if you do the research, it refers to God like he's a loving father. So visualize this. In Genesis 2, it says he's referred to as yod heh vav heh That's the God that loves you as father. And also Elohim, king of the universe, in charge of everything. So not only was he judge, he was father and judge. That's a big difference. It's very subtle. All right? Um, He is the God who loves you. All right, I read that. Genesis 2, 4. And if you look in all of chapter 2, every time God is referred to in chapter 2, he's referred to as yod heh vav elohim Let me read the instance. Um, Genesis 2.4 says, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Notice it said the Lord God. The Lord is yod heh vav You get that? And God is Elohim. So it's both of them together, those two words. And every time he's referred to in between Genesis on Genesis 2, he's always referred to as Yod Hey Vav Hey Elohim, which is God our Father and God our King. Y'all see the difference? All right. Satan, when he first read when um, when he first spoke to Eve, he dropped the word Yod Hey Vav Hey. You wouldn't, I would have never seen this unless I'm watching and listening to this awesome rabbi. It says, Satan dropped the word yod heh vav and referred to God as only judge. Let me go back and read that. I'm going to read Genesis 3, 1 again. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the... No, not that one. Wrong one. Uh, Okay, here it is. Um, Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Okay? He said, now, notice it said the Lord God made there. But it says, he said to the woman, did God actually say, what did he leave out there? He left out yod heh vav heh He said, did God actually say, it was almost, I like to think of it as a little disrespect. He said, did God judge king? Did he blah, 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 blah? I like to think of it um, also, think of um, when someone refers to our president. I don't like it. Some people say it all the time. Um, some people refer to our president as Trump or as Bush or Obama. I refer to our president as President Trump, as President Bush, President Obama. 
that's just respect. I don't go up and say, hey, Scott, that's Rabbi Scott. It's a simple thing, but it's a big deal. It's a huge deal. And I think that's exactly what happened here. The enemy said, did God? But he didn't say, the Lord your God. He said, did God? See the difference? All right, let me get back to the logic here. Um, I said almost, oh, I read that. Not that God is your father. If God is only the judge, you may not be convinced that he loves you and has your best interests. It's only a matter of time until God takes away all the trees. We must believe that God is just and will always judge fairly. Think about it. If God is only the judge and king, but he doesn't love you, maybe he's a tyrant. Maybe he just has all this power, and in a moment, he's going to do away with you. See the difference? It's very subtle, but it's a big deal. Do we worship God only because he is powerful? I hope not. If God doesn't love me, he is just a tyrant in the sky. I may want to do almost anything to overthrow him because he is only all-powerful. He put the tree off limits because he loves us. That's why he put the tree off limits. Why bother to put the tree in the garden in the first place? Think about it. Why would he put the tree in the garden and he didn't want us to touch it? That doesn't make any sense. I'm going to explain, hopefully. I have, I have grandbabies. It's still weird to say I have grandbabies. Um, Nikomi and Ayumi, they're awesome. If I want to give them a gift, if I want to give a gift to Nikomi and Ayumi, and I want, I want them to always remember that that gift came from me. It's not that I don't want them to have the gift, but I want them to remember that that gift that I gave them came from me. I don't want to just throw stuff at them, right? That would be ridiculous. You don't want to do that. Uh, I want them to be grateful and not just think it's automatic. Like my children, I don't, want, I don't want Caleb and Aaron to always go to the refrigerator and think food just miraculously jumps in the refrigerator. It was a miracle. We have eggs. No, I want them to always know that the food came from some other place. That's what God wants us always to remember, that everything comes from him. He is not a tyrant in the sky. He wants us to know that he loves us, he cares for us, but he is all powerful. Powerful. He is the one who gives us everything. That's the whole reason for the different trees in the garden. He said, enjoy all of the fruit of the garden while understanding that they are gifts from your loving God. That's what we should remember. You acknowledge that there are gifts in God's garden by acknowledging and serving him because it's his garden. Here's another analogy. What if you had a parent that was super rich? Anybody got super rich parents around here? No, anyway. Maybe. Okay, I didn't. But you know they could care less about you. They were billionaires, but they don't like you. Matter of fact, they hate you. I'm just being, I just kind of me in the face. Maybe they were really mean and harsh with you, and you really thought they didn't care about you. You may say, you know what? You keep your money, and I'm just going to figure it out. See the difference? I want, God wants us to know that he loves us so much that we need to always keep coming to him. Not that he's a tyrant in the sky. That's the big difference. We're, rec we're recognizing God as master and as loving parent. And next question here is why is it called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Why is it called? Well, keep it simple. I love to keep it simple. And that's something else to remember. If you don't understand something, I believe God is the way God um, teaches us is I believe he's like in another dimension because if we don't understand something I believe we need to just step back and try to see it from God's point of view you ever been very frustrated and angry about whatever it's because we really don't know enough that's the only reason and when we can step back sometimes we like to call it you're going to be the bigger person well that's really what you're doing but you're being the bigger person by stepping back and say okay let me see this from another viewpoint so I can get to it all right, let's get back to this. Um, in Genesis 1, we talked about earlier the word tov, which is good. In Genesis 6, 5, and do I want to read that? Yes. 
Let's not read that. Um, that's the Noah story. He talked about this word called evil. The word evil is ra. Visualize. It's very simple. Good, we want to keep that. Tov. In Genesis 6, 5, it says the evil in man, God saw the evil in man, and he destroyed the world. So if it's evil, we want to get rid of that. Get rid of Ra. So keep that in mind. So good, keep it. Evil, get rid of it. These are the grades that God gave to judge his world. Visualize that. This tree is off limits because these ultimate judgments of good or bad is God's job and not man. Let me read that again. It says, why is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Why did he not want us to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Because he wanted that to be off limits to us. Let me read this part. It says, this tree is off limits because these ultimate judgments of good and evil are God's job, not man's. We cannot say what's good and what's evil. We need to always go to God and say, God is declaring what's good and evil. Only the maker of the system can be trusted to make these decisions. Think about the game Monopoly. Anybody like playing Monopoly in here? Any Monopoly players? There we go. Who created Monopoly? Parker Brothers, right? Can I change the rules of the game? People do it all the time, right? <laughs> but should I change the rules of the game? No, I can't. I can, but that's wrong. It was somebody that got some cheating going on, you know, somewhere. But people change the rules all the time. In, in Monopoly, you must go around once before you can collect $200. God, anybody know the game, right? What if I say, you know, I don't want to go around once. I want to go around halfway, and I'm going to collect my $200. People do this all the time when we say, I'm going to determine Tove. I'm going to determine Ra. That's why he said, don't partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not that you're not supposed to know the knowledge of good and evil, because God wants us to know the difference between good and evil. It's just you can't change the system, because God already created the system. He's like, he's like Parker Brothers. I can't say halfway, I'm going to change it all. That's wrong. And people do this all the time. We do this all the time. This is dangerous. Only God can judge if something is good or evil. From the beginning, from the beginning, it only makes sense that God wants his culture to be our culture. God chose the Jewish people to bring us the Messiah and to share his culture and way of living with the world. That is a daunting task. I just want us to understand that. That's, that is the foundation. God, is, God wants the culture of, he wants his culture to be displayed on the earth. And he chose the Jewish, Jewish people to start this, to share this. And if you don't understand that he chose the Jewish people, you're not reading the Bible. You're reading something else. So you've got to have that foundation. But just because it's, and just understand this too as well, just because it's Jewish does not mean it was God's original intent. Be clear on that. Because sometimes we get so into the Jewish idea and to a lot of the rabbinical teachings that we believe this is what God wanted us to do. No, that's just not the case. That's why we need to use them as a model. And I'm so grateful for the model. I'm grateful, and I want to use that base and that foundation. But some things are just way left field, and I just don't believe that that's what God would want us to do. In the title of this message, what we're looking at is Greek culture and Jewish cu cultures colliding. We're looking at African cultures, Jewish cultures colliding. And then next week, we're going to add to it, if we have time, we're going to look at Chinese cultures as well. We're going to see what happened when these different cultures collided a lot. And again, this is just foundation. So this week I like to call just Foundation 101 or whatever you want to call it. All right, next foundation. Don't get pulled into the dominant culture. What's the dominant culture? Well, that's a lot, right? All around us. Uh, I love studying sociology and other things. Uh, I have a definition. Sociology is the study of human behavior. That's all it is. The study of human behavior. How people, because we're very predictable. Y'all know that? You know how predictable we are? Everybody in here sits in the, almost the same place every week. Right? Be real. Don't lie. Come on. We do. I, I, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just a thing. 
And we just need to observe each other. And if we observe each other, it kind of helps us to be a better minister. Don't act like we don't know. Because the only half we act like we don't know, we got a pink elephant in the room and nobody acknowledges it. There's a pink elephant standing right here. There's not. And then we just go, oh, I don't see no pink elephant. There's no pink elephant there. And it's right there for us to address. And maybe that pink elephant is there to help us to understand God better. Does that make sense? So we need to be able to look outside of our world. Because sometimes things are there right in our face and we won't see it because we're not looking for it. We got to always look for anomalies. We were watching something about anomaly. Anomaly is something that happens and we're not expecting for it to happen. You're expecting me for me to say words right now, right? What if I were to come out there and start doing some gymnastics and some backflips? Y'all would be like, okay. He's kind of lost it there, right? Because you're not expecting that. We're always, ex that's why we can read so fast. Because your brain is expecting what the next word's going to be. It's just always, it's like you're looking forward. You're expecting. But sometimes, and again, it's good to try to look back and look for different things. Like we were, we were watching something on Moses. Moses was walking through the desert and he saw this bush that was burning and didn't get consumed. That should not be normal, right? Because if, if something is burning, what normally happens? It's consumed. Well, he noticed an anomaly. The anomaly was something that's not normal. It's something that happened outside of his world. And that's something that we need to know. We need to notice the burning bushes that are all around us that we don't necessarily see. And that's why we need to be able to be prayed up, walk with the Lord so that he can help us to see those things. So we can change people's lives. Because that's the whole point. And it all goes, that's why I wanted to go back to the foundation. The foundation one-on-one is, who's the judge? God is the judge. You're not the judge. If you think you know it all, you don't. Okay, I got to stop pointing. I'm working on my not pointing. Because we don't know it all. And if we think we know it all, that's when we need to go back and say, I need to humble myself and ask God to help me because I don't know it all. Because sometimes we can get that mindset. Is, any, is anybody guilty of having that mindset sometimes? I am. Sometimes we think, oh, I don't need, I'm not going to learn nothing in this situation. Maybe you come into a room, somebody's talking. Maybe at this moment, Anyway, uh, maybe you come, somebody, somebody's teaching, you go, I'm not going to learn nothing from this guy. He's, this is crazy. You know, I don't know what in the world he's talking about. Well, maybe you're going to miss something that's going to change your life because you have that attitude. Did I step on anybody's toes? Anyway, I'm just, all right, sorry. All right, the next one. Why do people do things that we do? That's the human behavior thing. Sometimes we do things, it's, I like to call it, and I was reading in a sociology book, um, it says the power of the situations. A lot of times we respond based on the situation. It's not negative all the time. Sometimes it's positive. Um, anybody heard of the Stanford Prison Study, 1972? That's that all the way. They had to stop the study. Anyway, it was a study. I would say watch the movie, but the movie's kind of bad. It's rated R and it's kind of ugly. So anyway, I do not endorse the movie, okay? But anyway, the, the point is if you read the study, it was an excellent study about they had it was in a prison they had mock prisoners we had mock prison guards and they were treating the prisoners in different ways and they were seeing how people respond and these were normal people they were business owners whatever college students they were doing different things and these people started acting in ways that they didn't think that they would act in and it was only because they put them in this situation they had, it was so bad that they had to stop the study. He just had to quit because these people were acting just way out of, you know, a prison guard who wasn't really a prison guard, but he was only a prison guard in the, in the study. You get the point? It's almost like sometimes, you ever put somebody in charge of something and it goes to their head? You're, you're the boss. I do that sometimes in class. I do that. I say, you're the leader. Now that I made him a leader, now he just then lost his mind. <laughs> He like, you need to get up and, whoa, whoa, dude, you need to just calm down. Okay, it's just not all that. Because we respond in different ways when we're put in different positions. That's just the way it is. And I don't want to just pick on the teenagers. All of us do that. This is a human behavior. And I think we need to be able to understand things. That's why we got to understand things from God's point of view. When you don't understand something, we got to pull back 
and say, how would God see this situation? Maybe I'm frustrated at this because I'm not seeing it the way God sees it. All right, now I'm going to go here with something real quick. Hope I don't make anybody mad. But race. Race just bugs me. It makes me angry under my skin, make me want to punch somebody. Was that a good analogy? Anyway, because it just seemed like so many things we start talking about, it, it always comes to a black or white issue. And really, race is not a thing when you talk about the scripture. We're all the same. Only difference between us is the, the skin tone, is the shade. My shade is kind of light brown. Some of y'all got a darker shade than me. Some of y'all have a lighter shade than me. That's the only thing with race. That's it. We all bleed the same way. We walk the same way. That's it. I just think we make such a big deal about it. Culture is different. Culture is completely different. Because different cultures, is, it's almost like how you were raised. That's okay. I think that's fine. And the only reason I want to talk about this is sometimes we can be pulled into the dominant culture, and that's not what God wants us to do. Does that make sense? Because somebody else, I think a lot of times, especially in the media, it's a smoke screen. We're talking about races here. This guy's a racist. This person's a racist. And a lot of times, it's just a smoke screen for something else that's going on over here. That's just my take, and I'm going to throw that out there. Thank you, Rabbi, for letting me speak this. <laughs> anyway, make me feel better. All right. All right, something else, more foundation. It really should be that shade, or I already read that. Um, culture, absolutely, yes, but race is just shades of brown. I, I put this example in here. I heard somebody say it. Think about cows. Do you have different types of cows? You got white cows. Anybody seen a brown cow? Yeah. Anybody seen, we know about the red heifer, right? I've never seen one of those. Well, I've seen it on a Google. But there are different shades of cows, right? Are they all still cows? Yeah, you think the brown cow is going to discriminate the white cow because, you know, they're different? You can't come over in my pasture. That's ridiculous, okay? That makes no sense. And I think we should see race the same way. And the thing is, in a, since we live in this culture, we do need to understand race. We need to understand how people are relating to each other as far as somebody is black, somebody is white. We do need to understand that because we don't need to be in the dark. Get that straight. I think we need to make sure we understand that completely. But I think God shows us things for three reasons. One, so we can pray for people. That's why. It's not for us to get pulled into that dominant culture. Because if we start being like, we start being not like God would want us to be, guess what? We're being just like them. We're just as bad. They're talking about races. We're yelling louder than them about races. Like, what's wrong? What's going on? Stop. That's all I want to just say, stop. If you are a believer in the Messiah, that's why foundation is everything. You got to understand that it's according to scripture. If you start to study it, race is just not a thing. It's not. We have different cultures all over the place. Did we have racism in the scripture? Yes. But understand this. In the scripture, just because something is truly stated does not make it the truth. That's a big difference. Because sometimes we can read the scripture, and sure they're talking about, um, example, Jacob. How many wives did he have? Two. Kind of four, really, right? He had a lot of children. Is it okay for us to have two, maybe four wives? No. Some of y'all are like, I don't know. I'm, I don't want to say anything. It's okay. No, it's not okay. Because I believe God is very clear on that. And we've called the fight in the congregation. Just joking, all right. But, but see, you get the point. Sometimes things are truly stated, but it's not the truth. That's why foundation is everything. And we can't get pulled into the dominant culture. Because some people, sometimes we'll read a scripture and we'll just run with it. We'll say, you know what, this is the truth. And nothing but the truth and the whole truth. And we didn't look at the foundation and we just missed it. And we're messing up a lot of people. Because we're just going in the wrong direction. That's why we've got to spend that time and study I've been reading, listening to um, an audio book by Booker T. Washington. Anybody heard of Booker T. Washington? He was, it, the, book, the book is called, um, was it, Up From Slavery? It's awesome. He grew up a slave. He talks about his 
all the situations and being a slave, talked about living in horrible situations. This is just what he grew up. But he's, as a child, just listening to him, he never got pulled into the dominant culture. He actually, if you listen to him, he was a slave, but he wasn't a slave. Get that. You can be in a dominant culture, but just because they're a certain way, you're completely different. And that's how we need to perceive our life right now. It's no different. I'm grateful. I am so grateful that I am not in that condition, and that's not my world. I didn't grow up that way at all. I have nothing to do with slavery. My parents had nothing to do with slavery. Maybe their parents. I think sometimes we use our, we use our parents' struggle, and it's not even our own. Okay, I won't even go there. I'm going to leave that alone for a minute. I'm going to leave it alone. But, but again, the reason I brought up Booker T. Washington was we need to make sure that we stay focused on what God has called us to do. Stay focused on him. Don't get sucked into the dominant culture. He actually, if you l- watch, listen to his reading and his teaching, he felt sorry for the slave master. He felt sorry for the one that was beaten on his mom. A lot of people felt anger and want to kill because that happens, right? And it's easy for me to stand here and say that because it's not happening to me right, right now. But that's why we got to stay outside of that world and understand the big picture. That's only when God can use us. Because if we get sucked into the dominant culture, guess what? We're just like them. So if he was to have that anger and he was to haul off and go and kill slave master, guess what? He just got sucked into his world. He pulled them into that same world. That's why we got to keep ourselves out here and not be sucked in. We have in our world today a lot of things. Um, Christmas. Yeah, I went there. Easter. Different holidays. Right? I'm not saying I don't agree. It's not that it's, the point is don't get sucked into the culture. We need to be aware of it. I know that Christmas is there. And there's a lot of awesome people who celebrate Christmas. It's great. I have a lot of family members that celebrate Christmas. I'm not going tackling any Christmas trees, not doing any of that stuff. You know, it might be my thoughts. But I don't celebrate Christmas because I don't believe this is what God would want us to do. It's really that simple. You know, and if somebody is open enough, to, if they want to, you want to share with them, this is how God is using us. We get the opportunity to share. We share. That's it. That's it. It's that simple. And so when God, I think I left off on my, we'll leave off on this. God shows us things, I said for three reasons and only gave you one. God shows us things because, one, we need to pray. So maybe God is showing you this situation because you need to pray for them. Two, maybe God is showing you something because you need to confront them. A lot of us don't like that. And I'm a, that's me. Confrontation is hard for me. I'm just being real. Is anybody else confrontation hard for you? It's, it's hard for me. It's hard for me to confront people. But you know what? I'm learning to confront people more. Because I know this is a stronghold for me. So that's something I need to work on. And if God is showing you that it's a stronghold for you, guess what? You need to work on it too. Right? And if not, you'll just keep avoiding it. You'll avoid confrontation the rest of your life. I'm not going to confront people. I don't want to confront people. And you know what? That's probably the place of your greatest blessing. Because you're missing out on that. All right, let's get back to that. So you need to pray for people when God shows you things. You need to confront people. And the third one is you may need to just avoid them. That's why God shows us things. Sometimes he shows you the situation so you can stay completely away from them so you don't get pulled into it. That's okay. Are we grateful for that? I am so grateful. I got a lot of stories. I won't even go there yet because I ain't got time. We, anyway, we got time. Of things that God has shown me that I needed to completely avoid. Because maybe in my mind, I wasn't ready to handle it at that stage in life. And for me, at that moment in time, that would be a sin. Does that make sense? Sin is different for all of us. We know certain things are not a sin, obviously. No one in here should murder anybody, right? We know that. Are we cool on that? They're like, no, murder is okay. Nobody believes that, right? Murder is bad. But there's certain things for each one of us, God is it's almost positioned us, and it's a sin for us. It's like for me, I have certain things that I place in my life as far as my health. I can't do A, and I won't even go there because I know I'll step on a lot of toes and get a lot of angry looks. I look down when I say this. Anyway, 
But there's a lot of things as far as eating that God has placed in my life. For me, if I go outside of my boundaries that I have placed for me, it's going to be a sin for me. Because I've placed, it's almost like I have a covenant with that. I've made that. And all of us do that with certain situations. And it's all kind of stories. Everybody has their own thing. That's how awesome God is. Because God can deal with each one of us in our own individual ways. That's amazing. That just messes up my mind thinking about it. But anyway, I think this is where we need to end. Um, so next week, we're going to continue. And that was all foundation. We, we're going to talk about how the Greek culture, how African culture, how Jewish culture, and how Chinese culture collided with the Jewish culture. And it was, it's amazing. I love it. Just to give you a little teaser, I love this. Um, if you look at any of the, if you look at the Chinese, the old letters, I have a book. And it's, some of y'all may have heard this. But the story of, the crea of creation is in the Chinese letters. It's amazing. I just, when I saw that, I was just floored. I was like, wow. But it's all over the place if we're looking for it. Somebody who's Chinese, maybe you're listening to this right now in China. Maybe you never heard this before in your life. And maybe this is a point where you can go and do some research. You know, God is showing me himself through my own language. And I didn't even know it all of my life. That happens. How many of us, we've seen some things have been right there in our face all of our life and we never recognized it. It was there the entire time. And I have a lot of stories and I can't go there. All right. Y'all like, yes. Okay, let's pray. Father, we just love you so much and just thank you for your word and thank you for allowing us to share you, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to walk with you, Lord. Show us how to, to walk with you better so that we can be a blessing to people around us, Lord, and to affect our culture. Lord, thank you, Lord. You're, it's very clear that the group with the loudest voice sometimes affects the culture. Lord, show us how to be loud, loud in our own way about you, Lord. Show us how to be proud and not prideful, but just be, be confident in walking with you, Lord, to the point that we will inspire people to love you just like we love you, Father. And I give you praise for everything that you're going to do in Yeshua's name. Amen.